Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Star Ladder Season 11 America. We've got another singleton game for the day. So, just a quick little broadcast here. We've got Pain Gaming versus Team E Hug. Team E Hug, of course, now the Infinity Plus 5 stack. Today, their roster is SNA, SN7, Lust, Infinity, and NJW. So, an array of faces that we recognize here and pretty close to what was the Infinity stack throughout the uh, Summit 2 America qualifier. So, they have against Pain Gaming, uh, Pain kind of the favorites here, but uh, we'll see. Who knows what to expect from this new squad. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and hop right into our little game here. And E-Hug will be on our Radiant side to get things started. Well, that implies there's more going on after this. Pain Gaming, they'll be on the Dyer here. It was a first pick Bat Rider for old Pain Gaming. And it's kind of a slow draft, actually. Both teams taking their time, but Team E-Hug, they grab the Faceless Void and the Puck as an Oper. Not a bad way to get things started. Usually picking a Puck that early on is maybe a, a little bit risky, just uh, given the nature of the hero and how he can be countered, though we can't forget that Puck can also be in the off lane. And I think that's a way that E-Hug has actually utilized him a bit uh, in the past. <clears throat> So, third and fourth bands coming out here. Ogre, as well as the Ancient Apparition band from Pain Gaming. And E-Hug, they'll ban out some of the carries and some split pushers at that. Boy, they really don't want to deal with the pushing heroes. Death Prophet, Brew, and then they'll take out TB and the Lycan. So, it looks like they want to be the ones to take the team fight. Maybe pressure towers and not have to worry about a 4 plus 1 type strategy with that one. Running into their side lanes, knocking down their towers while they're trying to push up the mid and take some victorious team fights. Now, I do like this second pick from Pain Gaming makes a lot of sense when paired with the Bat Rider as kind of a deny pick in that of the Vengeful Spirit. A swap is a way to instantly break the lasso if used defensively and can really make Bat Rider's life difficult. So Pain will pick her up, maybe get a little bit of that Roshan control with the minus armor from her terrifying scream and um, well, get a pretty aggressive support for themselves. Pain game and running low on reserve time here. About 30 seconds left as they decide what to do with this third pick. Still, the sky's the limit. They could use pretty much anything here. They've got their offlaner and the bat rider and their first support. And here they'll pick up their second support, the big leafy treant protector. An interesting support pairing. You don't see these two together all that frequently. Tree, obviously known for his anti-push capabilities with the global living armor to heal up the towers. Um, I guess some good team fight, pretty good against the Void. You can help people out uh, outside of the Chrono with the uh, living armor. And Overgrowth, pretty big radius, uh, depending on the positioning. Sometimes you can stop Void dead in his tracks despite being in his Chrono. So it kind of forces him to look towards a BKB at some point. Manta style, obviously a tool to deal with the Treant ulti, but I don't think one Void will naturally gravitate to unless Pain Gaming pick up like a Wraith King here or something ridiculous, though. I can't imagine that being the case. Uh, Wraith King against Void. Well, I guess the ultimate's not too bad against Chronosphere, but that's a rough lane with Treant and uh, your Wraith King. Looks like they'll go in a totally different direction. Pain Gaming, they're still picking some pushing heroes. They grab the Pugna of all heroes. Now, Pugna's one, he's, he's talked about a lot, but not really picked that often. I know uh, Merlini is a big fan. Always loving the, the Pugna, saying, oh, Pugna's ownage, and he can be. Uh, can certainly be potent in pushing strats. I think they'll probably put him on the one in the safe lane, but it's a little bit hard to tell. They could also mid their Pugna. I'm trying to think if I've seen Pain Gaming do this, and I don't think that I have. Radiant team pick. But second support for Team E-Hug has already been picked up, and that's the Sand King. A great support duo when you've got a Faceless Void Puck. The Sand King and the Witch Doctor, very classic five-man Dota team fight all around, starting in that mid-game, probably around like the 15-minute mark. You're going to see this E-Hug strategy just hit their stride. Sand King's going to get his Blink Dagger. Witch Doctor will have his six. Puck will have his Blink Dagger, and Faceless Void will hopefully have Mask of Madness power treads at that point. They're just going to run around, womp, 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 getting some bashes, getting some kills and uh, bringing the hurt onto pain game and giving them a taste of their uh, their own medicine there 
It should work out pretty well with the Triant Protector and Venge. They are an okay roaming duo. The Leech Seed is very potent early on, especially if Mr. Triant goes for some early boots. And obviously the Magic Missile, pretty good for the Vengeful Spirit. So maybe they could try and <coughs> pressure the Sand King a little bit, but I don't know how well that'll work out. I have a good feeling this Sand King will uh, have an easy time in the jungle and get himself a well-timed blink. They'll probably offlane the Void, put the Puck mid, and Team E-Hug now looking for what will probably be their one and their safe lane farmer. Something to go with the Witch Doctor that doesn't need too much babysitting. I think they'll grab a ranged here. If they want to go all out, team fight synergy, a gyrocopter could be really nice for E-Hug here. Uh, they could take something like a Morphling, not too bad with the Faceless Void and the Chrono. Um, hmm, who else carry-wise are we looking at here? Kind of depends how late they want to take it or if they want to uh, grab somebody who can um, really synergize with uh, a little bit of push. Like, they could grab something like a safe lane Dragon Knight. That would be a little funky, but give them a nice little pushing power off the pack end of their team fight. Someone who can scale very nicely towards the late game. Um, and also just gets another stun on the field. You know, if he goes a Shadow Blade, nice tempo controller, him and the puck moving around grabbing ganks. I can see it working here. Especially against heroes like Pugna. Pugna really susceptible to ganks in that mid lane. He's just so squishy. He is a, he is the definition of a glass cannon. Uh, he'll be knocking down towers, moving around, dropping people like they're hot. But a Shadow Blade DK could certainly, certainly be rough for him. Um, who else can carry and do damage in the Chrono? I'm curious what E-Hug will grab remaining. here for their safe lane. Five seconds remaining. Ooh, the Necrophos. Okay. So another good option here. Um, pretty good synergy with the Void, the ultimate in particular. What's great about this mess of heroes is through all of these ultimates, all of this lockdown, you're pretty much always going to find someone just to isolate with that Reaper Scythe. And that means E-Hug should be able to start off basically any of these team fights in a 4v5 where they can have, like, for example, Sand King blinks in, hits him with a stun, there's some follow-up damage from the Witch Doctor or Puck. Void hops in, hits him with a Chrono, then there's follow-up damage from outside. Or Puck initiates with a Dream Coil, full rotation from the Rift and the Orb, and that should get him pretty close to half health. Necro blasts him with the Death Pulse, hits him with a Reaper Scythe, and oh baby, you've got a kill! And then you're looking good for the follow-up team fight after that. I like this E-Hug lineup, I have to admit. Very well-rounded, very safe, very stable. All heroes we've seen a lot of, and uh, I think they're... In a pretty good spot. Now, Pain Gaming, what can they grab with this final pick? Either a mid or a safe laner. They've got a couple of options, and they will be the ones to take the Dragonite here. Okay, so they get a little bit of extra pushing power. It's an odd lineup, though. They've got pretty solid push. I guess about as, as much push as you would ever need. With Pugna, they often say it's not will he push down towers, but when will he push down the towers. And Dragonite, sort of uh, suffering a similar plight. They do have a Bat Rider who can control some. Some of the tempos, Gren does play a good bat rider. Hmm. I think a lot of this is going to rely on how well the Dragonite is able to do and how well the bat rider uh, is able to do. Infinity should have a pretty good time against 4DR in the mid lane. Um, it'll be a bottle crow fest, and I don't think there should be any kills, but Puck should have a, a little bit of an advantage at least in that matchup. Um... Bat Rider, he'll have the jungle to retreat to, so hopefully his supports will be there to get some stacks going nice and early, and he can get that Blink Dagger. I think that really needs to be a priority for Pain Gaming in this match, um, because they need a little bit of space. They'll knock down some towers early on, probably before... Um, oh boy, good old USE Sirs right back at it again. Oh god. Well, anyhow... They'll need someone to create some space for him. I, th I think a Shadow Blade on the Dragon Knight, not quite as good when it's on this team. A BKB may be where he wants to go, but also not a great uh, BKB game. You've got Reaper's Scythe, you've got your Chronosphere. You've got some big ultimate piercing or uh, magic immunity piercing abilities, especially if Puck wants to go for an Ags. We've seen more and more Pucks doing that, especially in the American region. You've got your physical ultimate from the Witch Doctor rocking that. Ooh, it's the, the Alligator Jaw, the Rattle Bite. All right, the Charm. I like it. It's growing on me. Um, I don't know. You almost need the BKB to deal with the magic damage that's coming out, but um, you're you're also not really immune if you get your magic immunity here in this particular matchup. So maybe a rough game for DK in terms of uh, the itemization. <clears throat> Looks like Pain may actually try to aggro try here. <coughs> 
Mm, maybe not. Might just be the way they're kind of running down. Maybe they're going to hand off some wards or something. Ventral Spirit will start boots first on the dire side. A couple of consumables. And Baga on the tree will be the one to not go for the boots, but actually go for the consumables. He picks up the observers, and uh, he'll be the one playing the five, it looks like. So they need this Bat Rider to sort of set up team fights for him uh, from the pain perspective and just make E-Hug a little scared. When they're doing this five-man death ball, maybe they'll knock down some of the tier ones. I think probably the lane that Pugna's in will be able to take that tower down before E-Hug's ready to team fight. Maybe they'll be able to get a couple of them, but it's that 15 to 30 minute window, perhaps, where I think E-Hug are particularly scary. And they've got the late game. So the pain gaming real peak here is going to be early on, probably close to that 15 minute mark right when E-Hug are starting to come online. And I feel like they need to get a lot of momentum and use that to carry them into a potent mid game and, and have a chance at, at winning this one. But yeah, their draft definitely does not have that same level of synergy. It does have a fair bit of lockdown though. They've got a couple of uh, single target stuns, Bat Rider, and then you've got your tree and ulti. So they, they can definitely hold their own in these fights. They can skirmish around a bit. But first on the dock, it is going to be getting this Bat Rider back in the game. Come on, Gren, you can do it, buddy. I believe in you. I guess this gives us some time to check out some cosmetics. What are you rocking here, Gren? You're the man of the hour. And eh, nothing too interesting. Oh, wait, that's... Why is it... Did I mess that up? Come here, Bat Rider. Those are Witch Doctor's items. Oh, silly game. That's not right. All right, well, Pocky's rocking. What do we have here? Ooh, look at the Merry Wanderer's Brush. That's nice. The Orb of Reminiscence. Hey, I know this one. It's the Million Dollar Dream Coil, baby. Wow, this is a this is a tricked out Puck here. Look at these legendary wings. Rocking most of the Alliance set. Arr, that's a fierce looking fairy dragon. Look at all those hands. Look at all those phalanges. Jesus. What's he got? Three on each hand? Three on each foot? I don't know how you tell the difference. What does he do? do with all those fingers. This guy's got 18 fingers and a big old tail. The life of a fairy dragon. I feel like that could be the name of a of a short story. You know, a, a novel, a little bit of Puck fan fiction. The life of the fairy dragon. You know, talk about phasing in between the realms. Maybe I'll sit down and write myself a little short story later today. That sounds like fun. Oh, well, apparently he's uh, apparently he's loading in here. So hopefully it shouldn't be too much longer. Again, folks, it is just this one game today. The E-Hug versus Pain Gaming. I guess we could take this opportunity to take a look at the grid. How are we looking in the group stage for America here in this season of Starlighter? And Hot Tamales, it is SNA. Team Snock coming out way ahead. They are 5-0. and zero. Wow. They are off to the races here in this season of Starlighter. Leviathan, they're off to a rocky start. They'll be 1-4, and four, technically in fifth place, but... Uh, really just a result of the lack of matches that have been played. Root Gaming, they're 0-2 technically in last. But, um, yeah, it's Snaw with the great record. Everyone else only played a couple of games, you know, 2-1, and 1-1. One, one and one. Pretty straightforward, fairly evenly matched. But, man, Snaw really benefiting from this, this weird timing here in the early stages of Star Ladder Season 11 groups where a lot of the teams are involved in Dream League, involved in other tournaments, and... Snaw, man, they're ready to play all their games, and I don't know what it is. If there's something in the water, if they're just on point. But 5-0, and zero, they are looking, looking strong moving towards the playoffs. Well, while we were looking at this, unfortunately, we had him connect and then DC. That's unfortunate. Well, 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 can we remake? Oh, Jesus. And I thought this was going to be a quick game. We can look at some of the effigies. You shall not pass, says Enigma. That's pretty cool. I like that one. That's pretty badass. He's doing the the Gandalf pose. What do we have over here? Hey, who are you? Mr. Morphling. Oh, I've seen this. Like, brah? Yeah, Morphling's pretty good for this. He's got the little webbed hands. That's pretty cool. I like it. It's body. Ooh, he's a tornado. Any other effigies to check out here? Ooh, we got a Potom. Potom God. <laughs> it's the owl leaping. Oh, that's funny. And what do we have here? Ooh, Shadow Friend. <laughs> Looks like he's just starting to cast a Requiem where he's got his head tucked into his body and his 
hold himself. Oh, that's cute. It's like a little shadow fiend cocoon. Oh, that's sweet. Is there a fifth one? Do they just only they only have four? Somebody's lacking an effigy. Well, that's a bummer. All right, looks like we are gonna have a reconnect here, gang. Oh, now I know how Dakota was feeling the other day. We were like, oh, Dakota, he's only got two games. That's not too bad. Four hours later, Dakota comes trotting downstairs. Apparently, it was an issue with the pauses. Did they change the password, or are we just not rehosted yet? Come on, guys, host the lobby! Oh, my Lanta. All right, let's type in the password again. Nothing we can... Oh, oh, there we go. God Hunt stepping up. I like that. I think the admin went AFK. Wow. La la la. Hopefully this fixes it. That's the that's the real kicker here. This might not even fix it. We can only hope. One K ping says Gren. Well, what a bummer. Big time bummer. One K ping. Lol. I made a sideways face. Doing everything I can. All right, they're going to go for it. We'll see how it goes. All right, so, oh boy, he did captain's mode. Oh, Jesus. Okay, well, we're going to have to sit through it. Let's see. Maybe the teams are talking. No. Nope. All right, so what they'll probably do is random bands, and uh, they'll pick the same heroes, not in the same order, but just scoop them up. It is a bit advantageous to do captain's mode. You get a lot more time at the beginning. I think most of us are pretty aware of that, so there is a... Actually, a difference between the modes and how much time you get early on to plant wards and move around the map. Um, I think it's for mostly AP efficiency for, like, in-games. Um, you know, you don't, usually people aren't doing that much and in captain's mode. It's like the, the competitive, uh, competitive game mode, so you get a little more strategy time. A little more time for Roche, you know. So, same thing stands, Team E-Hug rocking this really strong team fight lineup. And Pain Gaming, a little bit all over the place. They've got some good initiation, and a little bit of team fight, and uh, pretty good amount of tower push. Pugna and DK, they've only got two tower pushers, but they're two really good ones, where DK just chunks them down, and oh, really Pugna's the one chunking them down. DK's slowly but surely taking them down with his DOT breath. Ew, dot breath. All right, so here we go. There's that Necrophos, the old man with no nose, old Vol Voldemort over there. He looks like if Voldemort and one of the elves from Harry Potter had a child. Look at those ears. Jesus. I do like the Necro, though. I think he's a pretty strong hero right now, just kind of in general. Um, we've seen a lot of games where he's just out of control. Somebody made a really good Reddit thread the other day uh, comparing the Stout Shield versus uh, Rings of Protection on various heroes, and... For some heroes, man, it hits this breakpoint of armor where it just makes them so tanky. And uh, we're talking double ring of protection. So, SN7, not starting double ring, but yeah, you never know, maybe transition into it. We've seen some Necros using them uh, just to go into uh, fast Tranquils and Basilius. Others just hang on to them and then ditch them once uh, you need the inventory slots and just get some of that uh, sell back gold. They're a pretty cheap investment, so not a bad way to do it. But enough about Necro foes. We've got a game on our hands, ladies and gents. Let's talk about the positions, the teams, the lanes, and who is doing what. 
On the Radiant side, we've got Team E-Hug, the new roster, the second roster for the team. Uh, we've got Lust here playing on the Witch Doctor. That'll be SN7 on the safe lane Necrofolks, so farming away in the mid. It'll be Infinity A playing on the Fairy Dragon Puck, and it'll make it uh, SNA on the Sand King. We'll see where he ends up. I reckon he'll be spending a fair bit of time in the jungle, but will station himself at the top rune to get things started, getting those kickers on first. Boots of speed. Whoa, King RD might be coming up the hill. Sna, gonna hit him with a lobster claw. But in comes Baga. Hasn't skilled anything quite yet, and that'll be the end of this little tiff to get things started. Last but not least on Ehog, it will be MJW on the off lane, Faceless Void. On the dire side, we've got Pain Gaming. Gren, XD, he'll be on the Bat Rider here in the off lane. That'll put VSW, their drafter, on the Vengeful Spirit. And he's going to block in the off lane. We'll see where he ends up. 40R heads mid on the Dragon Knight. Two Tangos and two Iron Branches. He'll be going for that fast bottle, crowing all day, just a farm with that Breathe of Fire safe lane. That puts us with two heroes, Baga on the Tree and Protector and King RD. On the safe lane, farming Pugna. He'll also start with the Ring of Protection, looking for that quick Bassy. And uh, looking to put some hurt on that tower nice and quick here. They're going to put some hurt on Faceless Void, too. Tree just goes right up in his face, starts bashing him with the branches. No boots on the tree. So we'll see if he levels Leech Seed first. You feel like you almost have to, because it gives you so much kill potential. A 4.5 second slow is pretty damn potent. 28% at that. Uh, but without boots first, Tree can't really branch you down quite as effectively, and he will go ahead and just grab the Living Armor. Level 1, very under, un, uh, very underwhelming spell. Long cooldown, doesn't really absorb that much damage, but still a worthy pickup. We'll see down bottom, VSW, whoa, I thought he might be blocked in the tree line there, but they're going to throw a cast. This could be your first blood stun from Sny. In comes Lust, there it is. Drawn by the uh, Witch Doctor, but now could be in some trouble, taking a lot of damage from the bat. Will go down, they'll trade one for one. And even though Ehug get the first blood, maybe not your ideal trade. Now this Bat Rider is going to have a lot of momentum under his belt. He does take a lot of damage, but Boots with 700 gold on top of it at a minute and a half. Not a bad place to be. So VSW on the Venge will hang out in the off lane, it seems, just to create some space for the Bat Rider. Pain Gaming happy with this 2-1-2. I guess feeling confident that King RD will get all the farm he needs against this off lane Faceless Void as long as he's got a tree ant to help stack and pull in the jungle. And that frees up the Ventral Spirit, who could be stacking in the jungle, the hard camp and the medium camp here for the Bat Rider to retreat to, or the Venge could just head to the lane, make space for the Bat Rider there, and then also slow down the farm of this safe lane Necro Foes. And I think this is the right call, especially when you're talking about a Necro. As this is a hero that tends to be a little more snowball-y and really unstoppable if he gets ahead. If he gets that momentum in the mid-game, he's maybe a level up, has some good items, he's spamming out that Death Pulse, and uh, it, it adds up pretty quick how much damage he can put out. But conversely, if he falls behind, kind of like that of Death Prophet. Is recovery possible, but uh, not easy? So putting a little bit of extra focus down in the bottom lane makes Necro's life a little more difficult, and... Ooh, Ventral Spirit headed to the bottom lane, but Puck picks up a haster, and they're starting to converge on Infinity. And he'll be A-OK -okay now that he's cruising around at uh, max movement speed. Bottom lane, Magic Missile out onto SN7, but supports are here. They want a recovery kill. VSW gets stunned up by the Burrow Strike. Cask bounces once between heroes. Courier comes flying in. Uh, VSW barely survives. Meanwhile, on the other side, Gren trying to find the kill on the Necro. Doesn't have the damage. Death Pulse will chase him down. Gren, he is certain to fall as the Necro... Sends him into a fiery grave. Down goes the Bat Rider, and that will make it 2-1 to one as Ehug get the better of that exchange. The support's in the right place at the right time as Payne decided to get a little aggressive. And if anything, I think the Dire Side coming out a little bit lucky on that one. The Courier walking in to the middle of that battle before the three-minute mark where it could be upgraded. Then you've got the Vengeful Spirit who walked away one hit from death. Doesn't really get much closer than that. And if all three of those have died instead of just one, that would have been a huge advantage for Team Ehug. They've already got one, though. About 750 gold, 300 experience in their favor. Offlane Void doing pretty well. He's racked up 10 last hits. That's not too shabby at all, and not really getting harassed that hard. He's got Boots, Stout Shield, and still sitting on three Tangos, so plenty of regeneration left. Gren getting a very aggressive here in the bottom lane, and this feels a little bit risky. Cask will bounce back to him, hits him twice. Is there a stun from the Sand King? Coming around the side, Snop falls just a little bit short. Don't know if they would have had enough for the kill anyhow, as Living Armor does come out. But Gren will survive, sips up the bottle, and he'll be A-OK -okay to head back to the lane. 
Now, speaking of this safe lane for Ehog, Necrophos is farming pretty well, as is the Bat Rider. They're within one or two last hits of each other. Some of those are jungle creeps, so perhaps the metric's a little bit misleading, but um, kind of going going well all around. For Ehug, the mid lane is where they're really victorious. Puck just decimating this DK right now. Infinity, last hit leader, 27-6 and six against the 13-1 Dragon Knight. 4DR now picks up a double damage rune, but... This is uh, a rocky mid lane here, and with the kill advantage, that's where Ehug is finding their edge. Gren getting aggressive down in the bottom lane. He's got Eventual Spirit to back him up, and now it's Necrophos that's in some trouble, spamming out the Death Pulse, but hey, it's Sand King. He's joined the party. Necro will barely live. VSW taking a lot of return damage from the Sand King, and there's a Witch Doctor wrapping around the backside. He's got a cask. Will bounce into the creep wave, but right back to the Venge. That'll make it 3-1 to one as Sna pick up yet another hero kill. This one going the way of the Sand King. And SNA himself, now 600, no, 500 gold on his brown boots, uh, perhaps looking towards a Blink Dagger pickup here in the near future. Pretty good stuff coming out of E-Hug. Great start for them. Looking nice and aggressive. Denied. So MJW, still farming well. As I said uh, during the draft, probably around 15 minutes is when E-Hug will really start to hit their stride and look to take that first big five-man team fight. Maybe if uh, some, some things go their way, pain um, will fall apart a little more and we see some more skirmishes go the way of Ehug. I guess it could possibly come a little bit sooner than that, but they'll have this big game stride where they'll have all of their stars aligning, all their ultimates available, some of their key items, namely the two Blink Daggers, one on the Puck, one on the Sand King. And that's when they'll really start to put on the hurt. Pain Gaming falling behind a little bit in the lanes. And with DK this far behind in the mid, he'll find his level 6. But he's not going to be this scary tempo controller. Meanwhile, you've got this Puck who, 6 minutes in, halfway to a Blink Dagger with Bottle and Brown Boots. I don't think he'll stop off for the Power Treads. Given that he's dominating already without the extra stats, he should be able to just rush the Blink and start controlling this game. Six minute rune will come out, Infinity heads top, and he'll grab himself the bounty rune down bottom. It's a battle for the rune, but S our VSW gets it on the venge. It is a haste, and going on to the Sand King, he's trying to make the great escape. Will Burrow Strike does not connect with a stun, and disjoints an auto attack with the Sandstorm. Kind of jukes VSW out. We'll make it back to the tower. Not enough man, uh, mana for a magic missile. Moving around the backside. Snot trying to fog as best he can. TP in from SN7. Has a Reaper Scythe. Turns it around to make it a one for one. So good setup from the Sand King. A little bit unlucky that it was a haste rune that spawned. Probably the only thing that would have yielded a kill in that scenario. Makes it a one for one. And a better trade for SN7. Well, obviously for him, but really for uh, E-Hug in general. Radiance Middle Tower is under attack. Their position one gets a kill out of it, and Pain Gaming, their support gets a kill. So up top, Baga coming around the backside, looking to jump on MJW. Hits him with a Leech Seed, but easy time walk back for MJW. Doing the 3 one, one you really don't see this build that often anymore. The high priority in the time walk, but if you do, it gives you some huge range and makes it very easy to escape. Feels like recently we've seen a lot more voids. Maxing out the time lock may or may not be grabbing the value point uh, in backtrack. And uh, maybe one or two points in the time walk, but all about that time lock, or in the um, time walk, but all about the time lock in terms of maxing it out at level seven and doing a lot of damage in that first chrono here in the top lane. MJW going in, he loses his tower, sets it up for the puck, orb falls short, and Infinity does not jaunt to it. Interesting choice. He does have a dream coil. I'm surprised he didn't hop to that one. I guess they all had a lot of HP, so not interested in possibly hopping to his death where they're not going to find a kill, but first tower of the game does come out. Pugna gets the kill, and obviously it goes the way of Pain Gaming, so that will help level out um, this early gold lead from Ehog early on. But this strategy, as we've seen on this patch, is not nearly as effective as it used to be. These early towers, especially the Tier 1s, just not worth that much gold. And, well, Pugna, I feel like he just needs to get more done. Eight minutes in and only one tower. That's not really great. It's okay pushing speed. We've seen towers fall, and, uh, fall a lot faster with heroes that are a lot less one-dimensional than the Pugna. So when do Pain start to get aggressive? They're really the ones on the clock. I think Ehog have stronger mid-game and stronger late-game. So when do Pain have uh, an advantage on paper is kind of the question I'm getting at. Maybe right when Batrider grabs his Blink Dagger and they've got this window where he can really control some uh, tempos and momentum of Ehog. But so far, they're just not able to do it. Mid lane, Tier 1 Tower taking some damage. Now they're starting to move around the lanes. It will be 40R in the Elder Dragon form. NJW gets stunned up by the Venge. They dive the tower. They find the kill. And now the fight will 
will break out. Stun in from the Sand King. A lot of damage on to the Dragon Knight. They'll find the kill. He'll be the first to go down. Now, King RD, he has another ward down, but it's not enough to keep him alive. Dream Coil's used. They even get the kill on the ward, and that will make it a two for nil trade. And they do have to concede their Tier 1 tower, but maybe e -Hug can push one off this. And Pain, again, just not getting what they need out of these pushes and rapidly starting to fall behind. Gren rotating from the bottom lane, 1800 gold. A very sensitive time for the Bat Rider. Definitely doesn't want to die. A lot of unreliable gold. And if he dies here trying to make a defense, it will really harbor that uh, Blink Dagger timing, which he desperately needs to regain some momentum for Pain. Looks like Ehug won't press their luck though. Bat Rider will just fly his way to the bottom lane, go back to farming, and Ehug will pretty much do the same. Witch Doctor, almost level six, so that'll be uh, another tool in the arsenal of Ehug. Necrophos possibly going for a Rod of Atos Rush. Uh, has power treads now with the Vitality Booster. Probably a sign that the Atos uh, will be the first item. Not a bad item to rush on the Necro. It gives you a really uh, good amount of stats, a good value item on that front. And the Cripple is very spammable. Great against the Bat Rider, especially before he has a Force Staff. Sure, he may trap somebody in the Lasso on fire, but if he can't isolate them from uh, their allies, isolate them from the Necro foes who can throw out some heals, then uh, really does limit the Bat Rider. And anyone else who tries to get away, not a lot of escape mechanisms on this Pain Gaming lineup. Venge can swap defensively, I suppose, but DK. K, Tree, and Pugna, all of them very susceptible to the uh, Atos. If they're on the retreat and Necrophos is there, he's going to be spamming out that cripple, and it will be very difficult to get away from the grips of the Reaper. MJW farming up the mid lane. Looks like he's well on his way to a good Mask of Madness timing on his power treads. Has the Morbid Mask there. And in the off lane, it'll be Infinity now farming on the puck. He did indeed go back to the power tread, so will slow down his blink timing, but honestly didn't even really need it that fast. And now about 500 gold away, getting plenty of space here in the top lane. Checking out the Dire Bat Rider. Finds his blink dagger here at the 11 minute mark. There you go. Grabs it at the side shop in lane. DK appears to be going for Drums of Endurance, Power Treads, and a Bracer in the inventory right now. King RD on the Pugna. Mech will be his item of choice, it looks like. Headdress to go with his Basilius. Anything interesting on the Courier for the Dire? Ah, just an Ogre Club here on the way for 40 yards. That will be the Dragon Knight. Stun out on the SN7 from the Venge, but nah, it just tickles him. Necro a little too tanky. Will be this Tier 1 Tower in the bottom lane. The next target for Pain Gaming, E-Hug. Don't seem too interested in making a defense. I think uh, they're okay with letting these Tier 1 Towers fall. Blink Dagger now comes out on the Sand King, so it could be a time where they want to take a team fight. It is sitting back at the base. Puck grabs his. I think E-Hug just not interested in forcing the issue here. If they had those Blink Daggers maybe a minute earlier, or if this push came a minute later, they could pose a defense, but they're just not in position to do it. And they'll hand it over for free. They don't, they don't even bother to glyph. King RD gets it on the Pugna. That will be uh, almost his mech. Now about a uh, third of the way to the recipe, and then he'll be there. Not really a great mech timing for uh, this Pugna. His farm, I guess you'd hope it to be maybe a little bit better. Spend a little more time farming in lane. Yeah, they've knocked down some towers, so you kind of have to do a little bit of both, I guess. I, I guess. Gold standard is uh, Viper or Enigma, I guess, with that mech timing. Yeah, more around that 10 minute mark in here before 12 minutes in and Pugna still isn't there. About 400 gold away and with all this roaming will take him some time. Tier 1 tower mid did take a little tickle of damage, but Pain doing a good job healing up their towers. Compliments to that tree and protector. That is Baga. So staying on point. He is level 5. Once you hit that third point in living armor, that's when it starts to become a lot more effective. Uh, and the heal is, is actually worth the spam. Uh, levels 3 and 4 are really value town there. SN7 in some trouble. Bottom lane. Smoke around the tree line. They'll jump him. King RD throws down the Nether Ward. Actually misses the Nether Blast, though. How comes the stun from Venge? There's the stun from DK. And it'll be more than enough to kill the Necro without that first Nether Blast. Looks like E-Hug will strike in the top lane, though. They won't hand over their Necro for free. They will get the Tier 1 tower. So at least find a little pick-me-up there. Not ideal, but hey, it's something. Nice 800 net worth gain for Pain Gaming off that, but it's still Ehug coming out ahead on the graphs. About 1,200 gold now and 3,500 experience. Looks like they're just finding more efficient farm around the map, and I would reckon a lot of that is coming from the Sand King here. He is level 7, the highest of the supports, and both Pain Gaming supports yet to find their level 6. Trian about halfway through in VSW, very recent into his level 5 excursion. So uh, Ehug just working the map a little more effectively, and... 
feeling pretty good about their level of control at this stage in the game. There is the Atos now out on the Necrophos, so uh, 1,100 hit points uh, when you're sitting on Int Treads. Not a bad place to be 14 minutes in. But Pain Gaming on their way over. Looks like they want to try to gank this Necro once more. Bat Rider, Blink Lasso at the ready. Blinks forward, falls a little bit of short. Flame Break back, does jump onto the Necro. But Dream Coil comes out, will not use the Dream Coil. Pucks here, and maybe they can find a kill on the Bat Rider. A lot of damage now from the Pugna. And Dragon Knight off to the side, but here's your Chrono from NJW. Connects on three, Death Ward off to the side. Mech will save the Venge at first, but she lives. 30 life. And Pugna will be there with a Decrep. No kills come out on either side in this little trade. The Hastrune on the Dragon Knight will be more than enough to keep him secure. And VSW survives by the skin of his teeth. E-Hug, happy with a break even there, though. As we've talked about many a time, it's Pain Gaming that are on the clock. They need to make plays happen to knock down towers. And if E-Hug can find a break even without conceding a hero kill, conceding damage on their towers, they'll be A-OK. -okay. If that's just more time, their cores can farm up, get a little bit stronger, and Infinity, man, he's just having no problems whatsoever. Going for the Void Stone, probably a Yule Scepter out next on him. Uh, could just be rushing, rushing a Scythe, but Yule's gives you a lot of possibilities. And, uh, again, another good item to use uh, against the Bat Rider, kind of defensively, if he hops forward, if you can catch a Yules on him, that will stop him dead in his tracks. How's Dragon Knight looking? I think his quest for a BKB is still ongoing here. Yep, certainly is. About 1,500 gold. That puts him just about a recipe away. A little extra after that. Bat Rider working on his Force Staff, but still a while away. And now, Faceless Void after the Mask of Madness. Uh, it appears, I would guess, a Maelstrom in his near future. Gloves of Haste, 1500 gold. Good itemization there. Um, yeah, magic damage, always good against the Dragonite. A pretty high armor hero, so you get a little extra bump there. And also good to have some extra magic damage in case Pugna has the urge to use Decrep defensively. A good mix of physical and magical output from E-Hug. So the Decrep can either be a savior or uh, a complete disaster, depending on the situation. But having that extra bit of magic damage just makes Pugna's life that much more difficult uh, in context of uh, usage of that spell. Baga on the Trian did end up picking up a Medallion of Courage, so it does have that minus armor capability. And that, uh, on top of the Scream from Venge, will make Roshan pretty easy. Uh, whenever it is that they choose to move into some Roshan territory. Top tier 2 tower under some pressure from Team E-Hug. And here we are 16 minutes in and they're ready to team fight. They're grouped up as 5. They've got their Blink Daggers. And this is when they're ready to make it happen. MJW in the front lines is level 11. So shorter cooldown on the Chrono. Has it up and trying to bait. They've got the Sand King in the tree line as is Lust. <laughs> looking for those ultimates and... I think E-Hug can afford to be a little more aggressive here. Looking at their vision, they don't know where the Radiant are. They don't have vision of the Venge and a lot missing. So, afraid that there could be a trap here like they see. Bat Rider comes in but goes a little bit early. His friends aren't quite here. King RD TP's in and it's a disaster for Pain Gaming. The mech comes out, not enough to save the Bat Rider. Pugna goes down, they get the kill on Sand King. But down goes the Venge. It's a one for three and Pain Gaming all over the place. Bat Rider sets Radiant the trap, but goes in before his teammates are there. Radiant's the TP in just doesn't attack. do enough. Sure, he gets the Mac, tries to buy him some time, but they just fall apart. They gotta have a more concerted effort than that. It has to be a five-man presence or no presence at all. If you're gonna run in one at a time, you might as well just let this tower go down and use the living armor from afar. Triant will keep the tower alive, however. Makes it nine to four. And 4,000 gold. Now about 6,000 experience in the favor of E-Hug. Cloak picked up on the Necrophos. Could be a pipe or a casual cloak. Either or. Good item pickups here. He could also just move into something like a Bloodstone. Tank up a little bit. MJW completes his Maelstrom off that successful team fight. And Puck still pulling up gold. But if he wants the Yules, he's just about there to right-click it from the shop at home. Looks like Lust on the Witch Doctor. Love this build. Point booster first. We'll go straight into the Aghanim Scepter to buff up that Death Ward. And... Kind of a game-changing item, especially if you have a Faceless Void on your team or anyone else with a big Disable. Uh, yeah, that has potential just to cripple your opponents in that uh, latter portion of the mid-game. Uh, basically, the second you grab that that big item, man, there's physical damage output coming like crazy. There's your Yules now up on the puck. So 18 minutes in, it is E-Hug with a 5,000 gold lead. Looking at item progression on the Dire side, we just don't see anything outside of the mech on King RD. That's the last big item they picked up. 
and haven't seen anything past a Dragonite. Didn't even pick up his Mithril Hammer. So now just sitting on an Ogre Club and a few steps further away from his BKB. Pardon me, he had the Mithril Hammer and now very close to the BKB. That Courier makes all the difference in the world. That BKB coming out here in about a creep kill's worth of gold. Nope, there it is. So, Magic Immunity for the Dragon Knight, that is good stuff for Pain Gaming, and an item that will help him out quite a bit in this next skirmish. Will be enough to totally turn the tides. I'm um, not totally convinced, as we talked about, there is quite a bit of uh, Magic Immunity piercing spells, but, well, certainly can't hurt for the side of Pain. Gren could be in some trouble here. Well, looking to clear out this double stack. Baga is nearby on the tree, has an ultimate at the ready. And we'll put down a ward, so that'll keep the Batrider safe. They've got some pretty good vision into the lane. E-Hug will just slow things down a little bit, though. Happy to take a good team fight and just kind of go back to farming and get the best of both worlds here. Find some good efficiency around the map. But Silence. also take skirmishes when they have their cooldowns and put some pressure on pain. Up top, looks like they're thinking about going onto the Faceless Void. Triant scouting it out. There is a Radiant Sentry. They see him. They know he's here. The Jig is up. Void. He'll hop back, but he misses the Chrono. Oh, no. Venge. Catching him off guard. There's the swap right into the Overgrowth. And they'll find a kill on the Faceless after a whiffed Chrono. Awkward play on both sides. Seems like E-Hug, they saw the tree and they just panicked. And Void said, hey, I better Chrono here. Throws it down and absolutely nothing. I am a little surprised that E-Hug are not grouping up to be a little more aggressive, but here we go. Sand King channels the ultimate. Burrow strike onto Gren, the follow-up from Puck. And it's an easy pick on the Bat Rider, and they'll turn him into Guano as he goes down. Nicely done. E-Hug using those ultimates I was just about to say. I think they can afford to be a little more aggressive. Anytime they have Epicenter, Dream Coil, Reaper's Scythe, Chronosphere, or some combination of the four, they should be looking to group up, use those ultis, find kills, further their farm, and shut down Pain Gaming at any opportunity they have. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, Living Armor trying to pick up this tower, but E-Hug will put some pressure into it. There is a big rotation coming from Pain. They will be able to keep this tower alive. Infinity throws an orb as they retreat. 40R in the front lines on the DK. BKB ready, has an Elder Dragon form. Won't be able to find anyone, though. And Sand King just TPs home. Necrophos now grabs a BKB, so it is just a casual cloak for now, and looks for magic immunity of his own. Think a little bit better for E-Hug this game. BKBs, I mean. Uh, there are some abilities that will go through it. You've got your overgrowth there. Uh, Dragonite will be doing a fair bit of physical damage, but Pugna is the big one. He's your big magic damage dealer, and BKB just straight counters this guy. Oh, SN7. We'll see it right here. Pops the BKB. Maybe... A little premature. No magic missile can come out, but it is also only level one. That is your 10 second BKB charge. Necrophos didn't have great vision, so doesn't know where the rest of Pain Gaming are. Thought they could be inbound, and that's one of those. If you don't use it right away, and there's a DK hiding in the trees, hey, you get hit by the dragon tail, and then all of a sudden you're not having a good time. Pain, they will use this opportunity to move right into the Roche pit, though. We'll see if they can bring it down before E-Hug want to react. With the minus armor, this is pretty easy. Medallion plus the Wave of Terror. Only a three-man Roche, but will be no problemo. E-Hug have no idea, and if they do, they do not seem to care. It will most likely be 40 yard to grab the Aegis. Already has the inventory slot made. It will be almost scattered out by Snot. Walks over on the Sand King. Will not find it. Roche goes down, and it is 40 yard on the DK to pick it up. Ehog thinking about pressuring that tier 2 tower in the top lane, but will be repelled and opt not to put any pressure on it. Bottom tier 1 is still standing. Not too many hit points left, but tier 1 in the mid, kind of the uh, priority tower right now. Your big access point in the, uh, around the map. Ehog will try to keep it alive, or uh, pardon me, Pain Gaming will try to keep it alive from Ehog. Has been a good game for the Treant, though. He's put a lot of effective healing into these towers and bought Pain a lot of time on their tier 1s. Looks like Snarl on the Sand King. He'll go for a BKB of his own. Ogre Club picked up, just farming away in the bottom. And about a recipe away from Magic Immunity. Up top, they'll find the Bat Rider. He's Nature's Veiled. And, or Nature's Guised, rather. And oh yeah, walks right by a sentry. Ends up being an easy one. MJW blows the Chrono to make sure they get the kill, but worth it for the Bat Rider. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, Snarl may be in some trouble. Forced to Burrow Strike back, pressuring the bottom tower. 
But Living Armor comes out, 40 RTPs in, and Sand King will not be able to pressure. Now back to the top lane, VSW on the Venge, perhaps thinking about making a defense. MJW wrapping around, will cut the creep wave. Puck's there with the orb, and Baga. He wants to make a defense, Leech Seed out onto MJW. Now Infinity hits him with a silence on the back foot as there are some TPs into the tower. Whoa, this Treant. All right, they will defend the tower. No kills come out, and E-Hug, they're just playing this so passively. Sna trying to be a little rat down bottom, but Living Armor gonna make his life difficult. Trapped inside of the lasso on top of the fire. Magic Missile and the Sand King, he will just barely live. I almost can't believe it. Or will he? Hey, it's the Batrider, he'll chase him down, and Sna falls after all. A very noble effort, almost makes it. Meanwhile, in the top lane, Puck. Coil out onto the Pugna. He'll get silenced, tries to force that out, but takes the tether stun. And it is MJW that gets the kill. But now the cavalry's arrived. DK blinks forward, does have an Aegis, so ready to fight already in Elder Dragon form. Gets caught in the Yules, nowhere to go. And this Radiant side just too damn elusive. And the Dragonite can't grab onto him. He may have talons, but can't hook on. And Dragonite will just have to use the ultimate to go back to farming. How much time left on the Aegis? About two and a half minutes, so at half duration, Dragonite really itching to use it. We'll have another rotation uh, with the ultimate here. I'll have about a minute to use the next ultimate to still use it with the Aegis. So not the end of the world for 40R, but not getting much out of this ultimate usage. He's doing a good job defending this tower. Baga rotating around, and they may look to take a fight. Does put down a sentry and finds an observer ward. So Ehog lose their vision. Puck playing very defensively, but now gets aggressive 40R. Hits him with a stun. Lust is here. Throws out the cask. Nowhere to bounce to. And Infinity now using the Yules defensively as he's on the run. Blink Dagger up in just a couple seconds. Treant hits him with an overgrowth, but he will be able to jump to the orb. It's Lust that will get left behind. Moves into the trees and, whoa, 40R. He BKBs it. Oh, man. That's a 10-second BKB for the Dragon Knight. And that is, that is not ideal. Whew. Witch Doctor was certainly dead. He, he'd given up. He was just standing there in the tree line. And 40 yards said, I better BKB this. He might stun me. Oh, boy. Silly, silly Dragon Knight. Probably just a uh, case of hitting the wrong hotkey, but still unfortunate. Sand King now has his Mithril. And uh, a little bit more than 1,000 gold until he'll have his BKB. Puck looks like either a BKB or an Ag's coming out, but probably the Magic Immunity does have an Ogre Club now. So E-Hug... Just massing out the magic immunity. They have two already, two more on the way. The only one not going for it will be the Witch Doctor, who is on the five and uh, looking towards the Aghanim Scepter if he gets any disposable income to play around with. Dire Side still not seeing too much item progression uh, except for that of the Blink Daggers. Uh, a couple of four staffs as well, one on the Pugna, one on the Bat Rider, King RD. Still very squishy, a bit more elusive, has some survivability with the mech, but just not a huge HP pool to play with here on this Pugna, and if he gets caught inside of a Chronosphere, gets stun-locked, uh, this will will be a short existence for the, the magic-dealing ghoul here. Also the Blink Dagger that we mentioned on 40R, the Dragon Knight, ready to blink, ready to move around the map, and so far been rather unsuccessful with it, but does have that catch potential. His age is very soon to expire, less than a minute, now about 30 seconds away, and not going to be able to make much use of it. Now a Blink Dagger out onto SN7, the Necrophos, He's picked up his BKB and Blink, has the value point booster, and will look towards an Ags. A great late game item on the Necro. You don't really need to rush the Ags. You can. In certain games, it's pretty good, but uh, I think generally speaking, there are some other items you can get earlier on, and all in all, SN7 has itemized really well here. And we'll have that tool to prevent buybacks really when Payne needs it most, and he's already a beefcake. About 2,000 HP, just 50 short when he's on strength treads. Pretty damn solid. So, Pain Gaming, they're grouped up. Uh, no more Aegis on the Dragon Knight. He does have 1,500 gold, but uh, also a gem now picked up on the Bat Rider. An interesting choice. Great against the Sand King, of course. But I feel like they have a little bit more to lose if they give the gem over. And they need to be careful. MJW smoked up, puts a lane ward down. Time walks forward, scares him back, does find the chrono off on the side. Traps in Baga. He'll get Reaper's Scythe, and the Death Ward comes out. BSW TPs in, takes some Death Ward damage, now gets chopped down by the Void. Sna caught by the lasso, but lives through it. Gren doing what damage he can. Sand King may live. 
off to the side. Yes, he sure will. Now MJW comes in. Gren in a bit of trouble. Meanwhile, from the mid part of the lane, Dragonite does survive, blinks over, takes a decent amount of damage. Puck will solo the Batrider off to the side. Meanwhile, King RD in some trouble. BKB's used, limiting his damage. Four staff around. Sand King comes back in. Stun on two. Sets up the kills. Puck brings in the orb. And it's a full five for nil exchange. E-hug just too damn elusive. Oh my gosh. I can't believe they all survived that. The Sand King just kiting around the Batrider all day. And Payne just can't lock anyone down. Ends up costing them their entire arsenal. Now 17 to 7. They're fating this game looking a lot more grim. They'll lose their tier 1 mid. Now they're tier 2. The glyph comes out, but they just don't have the resources. No tree end to even pop some living armor. It's 10,000 gold, 12,000 experience. And our Radiant team really taking control of this game. So what can you do if you're the Dire at this point? And I think at this point, um, well, that's a little, a little redundant, but this stage of the game, it's coming into a little bit of an outdraft. E-Hug just have the superior team fight. We're at that 30 minute mark where the superior late game also starting to kick in. Void with a full BKB, now 300, uh, 3,000 gold, MJW. Doing a lot of damage, BKB now up on the Sand King. He didn't even use the epicenter in that last fight. Instead, he spent his time kiting around the Bat Rider, survived the lasso, and well, I guess it was a good play from the Bat Rider to prevent the Sand King from getting off the epicenter, because that would have been a total disaster, but they frankly didn't even need it. Now he can just stand front and center in the team fights and just channel that in their faces, and there's nothing they can do about it. Necrophos, 200 gold away from just right-clicking that Aghanim Scepter. I don't know that he really needs to worry about preventing buybacks. No one on the Dyer remotely close to being able to afford it. But just the stats alone and uh, the reduced, well, not going to get the reduced cooldown anymore for Reaper Scythe. He is level 17. Uh, it's still some good stats on the item. Probably worth the pickup. There's your Mjolnir up on the Void. And Witch Doctor, I have to imagine, he's getting close to the Ags. Yeah, about 1,300 gold. And he's there, man. Picked up the two tanky items, the Ogre Club and the Point Booster. Double runes right now, up on infinity, invisibility, and double damage. Misses the orb on King RD, but hits him with the dream coil. Chronosphere used to interrupt the TP out, and King RD will certainly take a fall here in the top lane as the Void and the Puck jump on him and find a successful gank. Even Puck, looking for ways to deal with the BKB, now has a point booster of his own. MJW maybe getting left behind here. In comes the stun from Vengeful Spirit. Baga nearby has an overgrowth. Bat Rider inbound as well. Lasso at the ready with a blink dagger, but they won't hop on it. Puck shooting an orb over the tree line, just showing his presence, making himself known, and that'll be enough to deter the dire side. Meanwhile, bottom lane, 40R gets pinged out, stunned by the Sand King. BKB's used, Reaper's Scythe. And the Death Ward, just not enough to bring him down. Now Snon, kind of an awkward position. Swap on the Venge, and the BKB Sand King will survive, at least for now. 40R, Blinky Forward, trying to bring him down. While we're looking at this exchange, there was one up in the top lane. Batrider goes down, 40R, scooting forward, looks for the stun onto Sna, finds it, he channels the ultimate. Now they'll try to turn it around. Sna brings down the Dragon Knight, gets the kill on the Venge, and this elusive Sand King does it again. He lives with just a handful of hit points, channels the ulti this time, and turns it around, drops the hammer. And it's a three for nil around the map if you count the Bat Rider in the top lane. That died just about simultaneously. Now 21 to 7. Bottom tier 1 tower will certainly go down. They've even got a siege creep to help him out. MJW, he does he have detection? No, but Infinity does. He's picked up the gem from the Bat Rider. They go in on the Baga. He's silenced. He's getting low. The Faceless Void even burns a Chrono. Whoa, he chops that tree down, turns him into lumber. They're going to make a cabin out of him. Now 22 to 7. It's coming out all things E-Hug as they're just cutting through these towers with the tree end dead. There's no living armor to keep him alive. The tier 2 in the bottom falls and there is but one outer tower remaining and it is the tier 2 on the dire side of the map. Roshan 2 has come up. He's ready to be taken down on their way out. E-Hug will take out the dire double stack of Ancients before moving into the Roshan pit. And, uh, yeah, furthering their lead now. About 25,000 gold. Somewhere about 20, 26,000 experience, give or take. Uh, they are feeling very comfortable. And at this point, it is their game to throw. It would be a massive throw at that. As they just have complete control. BKBs and Aghanim Scepters, that's the name of the game for the Radiant side. Holy Toledo. They've got th four BKBs already, 
And we're looking at one Aghanim's completed and three on the way. Two of them pretty damn close as well. So there you go. That's uh, Aghanim's complete on the Necro and Witch Doctor 100 away. Card carrying members of the very exclusive BKB Aghanim Scepter Club. Watch out. Somebody call the presses. Dire side, moving to Roche. They need to take a risk, risk to get back in this game. I don't know that Roche 2 will be enough, but I like where their heads are at. I like the thought process, and they'll try to sneak it. Hey, they bump into Lust. They see him scouting it out. There's your lasso from the Bat Rider. He gets stunned. He gets killed. But support is here. MJW with a chrono on three. SN7 coming in, dropping the death pulses. BKB's used. It's the Sand King with the ultimate. Holy Toledo. Infinity picks up a triple kill as Pain Gaming get completely wiped up. Oh, the Dragonite stays alive a bit longer, but down he goes. Isolated again, another five for one exchange. As the puck drops the hammer, the sticky, sticky fairy dragon goo all over the faces of our dire team as Pain Gaming just get decimated by E-Hug. I'd call it an outdraft and also an outplay. Everything coming out E-Hug and Infinity Plus Five feeling good with their new sponsor. Wow. Perfect game from Infinity, ending 7-0 and 10 on the puck. Decimated the Dragonite in the mid lane, kept him down, stopped the tempos from being controlled, and, well, he just made it rain. That's that's really all there is to it. Everybody had a good game on the side of E-Hug. Good draft, good execution, and everything looking solid. Well, guys, that does wrap up our Star Ladder Europe, or America coverage for today. Just one game, E-Hug versus Payne. I'm Zayori. Thank you for joining me for this solo cast uh, in, between, in between Dream League matches. You can follow me on Twitter if you enjoyed the cast, at Zayori TV, and remember to follow at Beyond the Summit as well to stay up to date with all things happening in the studio as we are the official English commentary here for Star Ladder Season 11. It's been a pleasure, folks, but we'll see you next time for more Star Ladder coverage.